this guy here uh, making an experiment and he says, um, I'm on the verge of a major breakthrough, but I'm also at that point where chemistry leaves off and physics begins, so I'll, I'll have to drop it. Uh, yeah, I have to drop the whole thing. And uh, that's what we want to avoid. Yeah? So uh, there's a know-how at this interface and uh, that's what we're addressing in this degree program. Okay, but before I go into this, uh, I come back to this type of experiment uh, in a while. There's something bubbling here. You, you may be interested in what's happening later on, so I'll come back to this. But uh, for now, so you can enter the, the chemical physics degree program either through chemical science or through a physics science route. So we have entrance streams at UCC. They get these weird uh, letters and numbers, CK406, uh, is, the, is the label for the chemical science entrance stream program into first year, and CK408 is the entrance stream for physics and astrophysics. And uh, after this presentation, there will be a talk on the physics degree programs, and the physicists in, in physics, we have a couple of outlets uh, from this entrance stream CK408. And that is, you can either do single honors physics or single honors with astrophysics. Um, you can have joint honors degree together with maths, not together with chemistry, but together with maths. Uh, that's applied maths and also uh, pure maths. Or you can do, you can study education through physics. If you want to become a teacher and interested in teaching physics and education, physics is also possible. Now, the chemists have a similar selection. In the chemistry department, they have outlets in chemistry, chemistry with forensic science, chemistry of uh, pharmaceutical compounds, and again, the education route if you want to become a, uh, a, a teacher. And uh, so, uh, as a kind of a, at the interface between the chemistry department and the physics department, we have this degree, uh, chemical physics. And um, it's the only chemical physics... Is there any chairs left or seats? No. It's the... Um, it's the only chemical physics degree program in, in Ireland, so you can't study in, in, in Dublin or Galway or Limerick or wherever, but they have a few similar type of degree programs in the UK. So Bristol is an example, Edinburgh University, University College of London, Nottingham and Sheffield. This is probably not comprehensive, but um, uh, even in the UK, you only find a bit about a handful of universities that offer this kind of uh, uh, best world of both type of degree program between physics and chemistry. And we have a bit of a... Um, a tradition here in, in Cork in physical chemistry, and I want to go back to uh, the 17th century uh, and remind you of Robert Boyle. Robert Boyle was a, well, in those days you wouldn't call him a chemical physicist or a physical chemist, but he was interested in science. He was the 13th child of the Earl of Cork, I think the fifth son, so he was the Baba. He could just do whatever he liked, and he liked pumps. So he, in those days, he had equipment that had to do with air pumps and, and uh, he tried to manipulate gases, okay? And here's the thing, gases, if you deal with gases, is this physics or is it chemistry? Chemists deal with gases, but physicists also deal with gases, right? So here you are at the interface somehow between chemistry and physics, and Robert Boyle came up with Boyle's law, right? And Boyle's law says that pressure times volume is constant if the temperature is constant. So if the temperature of a gas is held constant, then the pressure times the volume is also is constant, is a constant. And that led later on to a, a, a gas law that is shown here. And this gas law says that pressure times volume is a constant times the temperature. So if the temperature also varies, then you can, uh, uh, when the temperature also varies, then you have to apply this equation, right? So we have three variables in this equation. And are they physical? Or is this a physical problem or is this a chemical problem? Yeah. So you're dealing with the pressure of a gas, the volume of a gas, and the temperature of a gas. Okay? It's called the ideal gas law. So if you if you keep, for example, the volume constant, yeah, the volume of a, of a container with a gas is constant, and you raise or you lower the pressure, then the temperature will go up and down. Okay? So if you keep uh, if you keep the pressure constant and you manipulate the volume or the temperature, then they behave proportional to each other. Right? So this is something that Robert Boyle um, dealt with. And, and I want to illustrate that here today with a, little, with a little experiment and discuss this a little bit, okay, this law. And bear in mind, is it chemistry or is it physics? Or is it food science? <laughs> I brought a couple of eggs, okay? So this again, where do chemical physicists or physical chemists go later on? What are the career plans? I'll come to that. There's a lot of career outlets. I mean, you, as a chemical physicist, you don't know what you will be, right? If you study dentistry, you will become a dentist. If you study chemical physics, we'll talk about that. Okay, so, eggs. Rum, pum, pum. 
how do you, <laughs> when you go to a fridge, yeah, in a foreign house, and you want to make a, an egg, and you look at the fridge, and the fridge looks a bit dodgy, you go, I wonder how old are the eggs in there? <laughs> how can you find out how old an egg is? What do you do? Put it into water. Exactly. What should happen? When it's fresh, it should sink. And when it's old, three, four, five weeks old, it'll float. It'll go up. And in between, it'll kind of it'll lift a little bit like this. Yeah? <laughs> and tends to go up, but it doesn't really go up. Why is that? It's because the shell of an egg is a membrane. It's, it's, it's porous. There's little holes in this membrane. And air from the surrounding can actually penetrate the egg. Okay, so air diffuses into the egg. So the egg shell is some form of a filter, okay? Uh, a molecular filter. It lets only very little bit of air into the egg over yeah, weeks. Yeah? So this is some form of a, a molecular filter. Yeah? This is what chemical physicists um, uh, uh, develop. Yeah? Molecular filters, sieves, find new materials that work on a molecular level. An egg shell is something very simple in that sense, but it's based on diffusion. It's diffusion Physics or is it chemistry? When you look at molecules diffusing in here, okay. Anyway, so that's that's how you find out when the air is in the egg, it doesn't become lighter as such, but the density of the because there's very little uh, gas going inside, but the density of the egg will reduce over time, and because the density of the egg is around about the density of water when it's freshly laid, the density is larger than that of water, it'll sink, and if the air is in there, the density is slightly smaller than that of water, and it'll rise to the top. Okay. How do you know that an egg is hard boiled or raw? What do you do? You look at it. Yeah? Loud? You spin it. Spin it. You spin it. Well, one of these is raw and one of them is hard boiled. <laughs> okay? So, let's spin this guy. Okay. Right. I'm really trying here to spin this, but for some reason I can't really spin it. Well, it spins but very badly, you know? So let's try this guy now. It spins very well. And what's more, it's going on its tip. Did you see that? It's still spinning. And now it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a top, yeah? Spinning top. Spins extremely well, and it goes on its top. This is the hard boiled egg. Yeah? So, why is that? Why is that? Uh, there is a quantity called the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia. In an egg, you have liquid. There's protein in there, yeah? egg white. And the liquid can be pushed to the outside of the egg when you spin it. So you have a lot of mass at the outside of the egg. So if you have... Um, an egg spinning like this, you have, this is the rotational axis, you have a lot of mass here and a lot of mass here if the liquid goes to the outside, okay? And uh, if it's on its top, uh, on its tip here, it's like this, then the mass is here and it's there. Now the distance of that mass here is larger than the distance of the mass here. And there's a quantity called the moment of inertia, m times r squared, m is the mass, so if you have a rotational axis and a point, a mass point here, and that mass point is spinning around an axis, this is the mass, and this is the distance r, this quantity n times r squared is called the moment of inertia. And that, that quantity measures how easily you can rotate a solid object or a rigid object. Okay? And of course, if an egg is in this position, the moment of inertia here is smaller then the moment of inertia here. And the larger the moment of inertia, the harder it is to spin the egg. Yeah? So here you have a large moment of inertia, small moment of inertia. That's why this is easier to rotate. And that's why the egg goes from this position into that position. When it's hard boiled, because it's rigid, it's solid. And when it's, um, when it's uh, uh, raw, then it's liquid, and the liquid tries tend to go to the outside, so you can't really spin it at all. Because the moment of inertia is large in it, becomes larger, and therefore you can't spin it. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, I'll take this egg, and I will put it on this flask of boiling water. Okay? I want to come back to this law. Okay? 
So if I put the egg on top of this bottle, what should actually happen if you look at this law? What do you expect to happen? Temperature increases inside. We put heat in there, right? So the temperature increases. Okay. And the egg is sitting on top. So the egg, well, I will, I will feed it, okay? But the egg will be sitting on top. Okay, so this is our flask. Okay. Now, if you look at the volume of the, of, the, of the bottle, the volume is constant, yeah? So the egg makes a seal, that's our seal, and we have a constant volume. Now we're putting heat into our, our flask, yeah? That's the boiling water. We're putting heat from the, from the heating uh, uh, plate here into the, into, the, into the bottle. That means the pressure should go up. If the temperature goes up, volume is constant, the pressure should go up, okay? So if the pressure goes up, the egg should be pushed off. Pressure means there's pressure on the egg that is larger on the inside than on the outside. On the outside, we have one atmosphere. On the inside, we start with one atmosphere of pressure. Now we put heat into it, temperature goes up, pressure goes up. The egg should start to jump, okay? Now, as soon as the egg jumps, yeah, the pressure will equalize again. Now we start again with an atmosphere, it, it hops down, and it will sit on the flask, it seals it again, you put heat into it, pressure goes up, egg goes up. So it will do something like, <coughs> yeah, it will start jumping. Now when we then cool it, if we then cool this flask, right, then the egg is sitting here, we cool the flask, and uh, the volume is constant. Yeah, if it's sitting here and the volume is constant, um, now we cool it. Pressure goes down. Okay, pressure should go down. But at the moment where it jumped the last time, where it jumped the last time, we had exactly the right pressure. The at one atmosphere outside, one atmosphere inside. Now, if the if the pressure is one atmosphere outside, one atmosphere inside, the volume should decrease. Okay, if the pressure is the same and the volume should decrease, that's exactly what should happen. And that's why the egg should go into the bottle and the volume should become smaller. So let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at this. Smurrabird, smurrabird, rum, tum, tum, tum. I, I made two just in case the egg disintegrates, okay? <laughs> if that does happen at times, you know, I, I have this. Uh, okay. So, again, we put it on top, see what happens. And for now, That's what's happening. Yeah? Jumping egg. It's a jumping egg. We put it in, pressure builds up. The moment the egg comes down, yeah? pressure builds up, the moment the egg comes down, pressure equalizes, pressure equalizes, pressure equalizes, yeah? Volume constant, pressure equalizes, volume constant. <laughs> I'll be your waiter for the day, well, yeah, so. Okay, now in order to cool it down, Made, um, got the cloth wet a little bit. Should stop putting heat into it, right? So now, when it jumped the last time, we had a pressure on, on an atmosphere on the outside, an atmosphere on the inside. Okay, so the pressure inside is the same as the outside, but now we're decreasing the temperature. Pressure in this state now, one atmosphere here, one atmosphere here. Okay. So this is constant. Now the temperature is going down because it's not on the heat anymore. We're not putting heat into it. Temperature is going down. Pressure is constant. The volume should decrease. What does it do? <laughs> it goes into the bottle. <laughs> okay. Is it chemistry or is it physics? Well, or is it food science? I'm not sure. It's but it's that's an example of an experiment that's somewhere at the interface between chemistry and physics. Okay. I think I motivated this now enough. Okay. So what are the core areas that we teach in chemical physics? The core areas are thermodynamics. So what we're doing here is a thermodynamic experiment. It's to do with thermal properties of, of, of matter, whether this is gases or solids or liquids, doesn't really matter. So we have thermodynamics. Quantum science. In chemistry, you deal with molecules. In physics, you deal with atoms and nuclei. It's all coming together in a very small, in the quantum world, so you're dealing with spectra and with quantum science, okay? Optics are tools that you use in order to study uh, quanta, 
Yeah? So through the interaction of light with matter, I'll show you this as an example later on, you find out about the energy levels, the dynamics, the time, the time dependencies of molecular processes. Okay? So that's why this is at the core. Also, structure of matter. What is structure made of? Yeah? Looking for new materials, yeah? molecular modeling, and also you need to simulate things. You need to understand why are things happening at the molecular level and why is this different from, from the macroscopic level. Yeah? So there's examples here of uh, quantum dots, yeah? quantum dot lasers, nanoparticles, nanostructures, micro resonators. Yeah? Um, if you etch things here, is it chemistry, is it physics, right? So if you make a, something that is extremely small, nanobots, yeah? nanomachines, they are done through chemical processing, but you, what you're aiming at is their function, their physical function. Yeah? It's right at the interface between chemistry and physics. Uh, you could even go to, to the other side to proteins and molecular, uh, you know, and, and biochemistry on a molecular level. Anyway, so modeling is, is also a big part of, of this degree program. So we want to give you a little bit of computer skills and modeling skills. Uh, it's very important that what is promoted in this program is skills. And computer logic came from Cork as well, so we, we celebrated the bicentenary of George Boone uh, three years back here. Um, so he was the first professor of mathematics in Cork, so we have a bit of a, a tradition in that respect as well. Okay, George Boone. So here's the example, interaction of light with matter. Yeah? So in experiments, you find out what's going on on a molecular or atomic level using light. Yeah? You look for the absorption or emission features of, of materials in the largest sense. Okay? Um, you can even go as far as astrophysics. Yeah? How do we know what's in the sun and how hot the sun is and what's happening on the sun? So this is the spectrum of the sun in the visible region. Yeah? So this is the colors that you can see, basically. And we know that there's hydrogen on the sun because this bit is black. Yeah? And we have more black bits somewhere here, yeah, there. Um, and these are absorption lines in the photosphere of the sun of hydrogen. And there's a lot of, this is sodium, yeah? you have a sodium doublet here. Yeah? We know there's sodium on the, on the sun because there's absorption lines of, of, of sodium in the photosphere of the sun. So the center of the sun is our light source, and the outer layer of the sun, it's called the photosphere, the outer layer, is the, the bit that is absorbing here. Yeah, so the core of the sun produces a beautiful red to blue spectrum, continuous, and the photosphere is cooler, and it takes a little bit of light out of this continuous spectrum. That's what you see here, the so-called Fraunhofer lines. Yeah? And if we do lab studies, if we know on Earth now, basically, what's going on in terms of we put calcium into a sample, and we put sodium into a sample, and hydrogen, and helium, and what have you, and you find out that where the, these materials absorb, you can tell, okay, if the exact colors where they absorb occur in the sun spectrum, that stuff must be there. Okay? Uh, also, the brightness of the spectrum, you can tell things about the temperature, yeah? remote sensing. If you go into a steelworks and you want to measure the temperature of a melt in a steelworks, you can't stick a thermometer in there. You stick a thermometer in, you melt it, goes, yeah? Terminator 2 or whatever. It just melts, okay? So you do this by remote sensing with, uh, with uh, looking at the color of your melt. The color of your melt will tell you how hot it is. Yeah? These are things that have to do with chemistry and with physics. Okay? Right, so now, in detail, what do we do in chemical physics? First, your engine stream. We have two engine streams, one going through physics and one going through chemistry. And the chemical physics degree program actually only starts in the second year. So in the first year, you are in this entrance stream, and you have these five outlets in physics if you go into the physics entrance streams, and you have these five other degree outlets in chemistry if you go into the chemistry entrance stream. And if you pick the right modules, the right courses in first year, you can decide after the first year, now I want to do chemical physics. So you're not determined in the first year what, what, what degree program you're going for. You have a choice of six if you go into physics, and you have a choice of <laughs> six. If you go into physics, you have a choice of six if you go into chemistry, okay? And that's including chemical physics. Now, um, that's why I have precondition to enter second year, if you go into this stream, yeah? So if you go into this stream, you can't do chemistry or pharmaceutical compounds, yeah? Uh, that's not possible. Then you have to go into the chemistry stream. If you want that as an option, you want to do chemistry or pharmaceutical compounds or chemical physics, then you have to enter in the chemistry stream. If you want to do uh, joint honors with maths, potentially, or chemical physics, you have to start here because if you go into the chemistry stream, you can't bridge over it to go into a joint honors degree with maths. Yeah? So that's bringing me back to all my degree programs here. Yeah? So these are the four others, and here are the, the four others. 
So if you start here, then these are your outlets plus chemical physics. And if you start on the, on the red side here, the CK48 side, then these are your outlets uh, plus chemical physics. Okay? So, so the decision is made after the first year whether you want to become a chemical physicist or not. And if you want to do this, then you have to take these modules in first year. And of these modules, all of them are compulsory except for this one. In UCC, you have to take 60 credits worth of courses, of modules, as we call them, 60 credits um, uh, for one year. Yeah? And, uh, and these are compulsory courses. So if you add the credits here, it's 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, yeah, whatever, 50. Um, and uh, if you want to do chemical physics, you have to do chemistry in first year, either 10 credits of chemistry or 15 credits of chemistry. Okay. If you don't take this, but you have other options, so these are core modules, there's other options, then um, uh, you're not eligible to go into chemical physics because you haven't had chemistry in the first year. You have to have chemistry in first year. Okay? Um, for example, there's other options, computer science. We offer computer science. We even offer biology modules as optional modules in physics. Yeah? So if you look at the calendar in UCC, if you look at the calendar, you will find all the different options that are on offer uh, in, uh, in first year. Okay? But you have to do maths. There's a lot of maths here. Look at this, yeah? Linear algebra, calculus, introduction to analysis, mechanics, and mathematical modeling. There's already a modeling course here in the first year. Okay. Now, if you go into the chemistry stream, uh, things are very similar, but the courses are called slightly differently. Again, this is the core here. You have to have chemistry and two physics modules. Okay. And to do slightly different mathematics modules, but they are at the same level. They're more taught for engineers. Uh, mechanics 1, mechanics 2, mathematical methods, mathematics 1 and 2. But they cover essentially the same stuff that we saw before here. That is calculus, yeah, linear algebra, um, and, and, and uh, mechanics. Well, it's even called mechanics, yeah, one and two. So they're in here as well. Now, um, you have to do 20 credits here of chemistry. So if you go into this stream, these 60 credits are essentially compulsory, yeah, if you go into the chemistry stream. That's not us, is it? No. Hopefully not. Second year, when you have decided that you are going into chemical physics, you do 40% chemistry, 40% physics, 20% maths in second year. And the same is true for third year. Okay? So the 40% physics are given here. And look at the topics, yeah? Introduction to quantum physics. Uh, introduction to thermodynamics and statistical physics. Yeah? These are exactly the kind of the core subjects that I, that I introduced earlier. Introduction to computational physics, modeling, yeah? simulations and modeling, experimental methods, yeah? that's on the physics side. Main group and transition element chemistry, energetics and kinetics, states of matter, yeah? states of matter. Here, phase transition, going from liquid to the gas state. Spectroscopy, I mentioned that earlier, yeah? interaction of light with matter. Structure, structure bonding and quantum mechanics. These are the topics you deal with. And then you have a little bit of maths as well, uh, because that's the language that we use. Yeah? So if, if you ask me, can I get away without maths? No, you can't. If you want to do chemical physics, you have to be also interested in maths. Yeah? It's without maths, you will not get through this degree program. So there's four-year methods and multivariable calculus. So it's a bit more complicated calculus. Third year, again, 40, 40, 20. Uh, again, topics I mentioned before, optics, quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, yeah, that's essentially light. Uh, introduction of condensed matter physics, solid state physics, yeah? experimental methods, you have an experimental uh, labs. Labs are attached to these courses as well, uh, all of them. Physical chemistry one and two, materials, yeah? environmental, a uh, big area for chemical physics as well. Environmental, yeah, it's out there, it's all chemistry and physics, yeah? and biology of course. Yeah? Environmentalist. Natural science, is the so the chemi chemi chemistry and physics is at the core of it. Scientific communication, literacy skills, and even programming. This is again for simulation, yeah? for getting skills, computer skills, C++ <coughs> programming, and computer modeling and numerical techniques. So it's quite heavy on that as well. And right, fourth year, we have two advanced research projects. So you do more than in chemistry, and you do more than in physics on the experimental side. The physicists do one project, the chemists do one project. You do two, one in the chemistry department, if you're interested in chemical physics and doing this, one in the chemistry department and one in the physics department, 12 weeks in one semester and 12 weeks in another semester. You're attached to a research group and you basically write a little report or a little bachelor thesis in each of these projects on each side, right? Which is kind of, you, you get to know two departments uh, quite well. 
atomic molecular and advanced computation physics are core modules in fourth year, and then you have options. You can pick 10 credits from this list, or you can pick 20 credits from, from this list of, of modules. Yeah? Again, lasers, photochemistry, spectroscopy, microscopy and modeling, advanced nanomaterials, yeah? atmospheric chemistry, yet again, and air pollution, here yeah, lasers and photonics. Yeah? So these are the topics you cover, quantum mechanics, semiconductor devices, radiative processes, and so on. So this is what you do in, in uh, fourth year, you get uh, options. In second and third year, uh, everything is compulsory, yeah? So you have, no, you have no options to pick certain topics, but in fourth year, uh, then eventually you can. And also you have a choice of projects, yeah? So we offer many projects, and then the students pick the projects that they're most interested in, in fourth year. Okay, expertise and skills. Coming back to this, I have four minutes, yeah? Okay, timing. Um, so molecular sciences, optical technologies, you learn a lot about this, solid experimental training, yeah? The two final year research projects is quite demanding, and you have practicals all along the way. Yeah? So it's, if you do uh, maths with physics, then the emphasis is really on, on theory and maths. Yeah? It's almost like a theoretical physics degree program, which we haven't got yet. Uh, and here, uh, the driver is experiments, hands-on stuff. Yeah? Get to know your experiments. Problem-solving skills, very important. This is what you promote. Okay? Uh, computing skills and modeling, IT skills. Yeah? Career outlets, as I said, you don't, I said this before, if you study, the same is true for physics, I and mean, first of all, also for chemistry, you don't really, you know, we are being asked, what will I be when I study this? You can be a lot of things, yeah? Uh, Chancellor of Germany is a physicist, right? I mean, not that you want to be Chancellor of Germany, but, well, <laughs> but she, she, you know, the, the people go into insurances because of their mathematical skills and their modeling skills. They are okay at IT stuff, and they end up in an insurance as a physicist, yeah? Of course, we have, uh, uh, um, industry here in the Cork area that are interested in exactly the skills that people have. Yeah, if you looked at Little Island or Ring of Skiddy, there's a, a good number of companies that are interested in people who have who are exactly at this interface. If you look at Tyndall National Institute, our flagship research institute, it's run by physicists, by chemists, and by engineers, micro engineers, yeah, electric engineers. So it's it's exactly this interface. They are desperately looking for people who have physics skills and and chemistry skills who are who dare <laughs> making a sample and cooking something and doing something chemical, still understanding the physics and the drive behind this. Yeah? So uh, that's, that's the advantage of such an interdisciplinary program. Yeah? Chemical engineering, analytics, laser industry, we have people who develop lighting solutions, things like that, garages of ours, um, went into these kind of areas. IT-related areas, data processing, I mentioned that before. Okay, so uh, again, my name is Andy Ruth, and this is my, these are my coordinates, yeah, telephone number and email if you're interested, and that's my colleague now in chemistry who's coordinating this degree program on the chemistry side. So we have two coordinators, and, uh, and I, obviously I, I, uh, I'm the one who gave the presentation today.